Okay. Um, let's see. We have the same announcements today as we had the other day. Nothing has changed. Um, except that today's plan is to talk about bee trees. But before we talk about bee trees, we have to talk a little bit more about uh, hash functions just as kind of uh, like a wrap-up and a warm-up. So we saw two collision strategies for hash tables. We saw one that was called separate chaining and another one that was called open addressing. And the question is, which of those collision strategies is best? And of course, the answer to this question is, it depends, but that's what I want to talk about, is what does it depend on? So what does it depend on? What are the considerations when you're considering choosing a collision resolution strategy? What are the factors involved in choosing that strategy? Okay, what is one factor involved in choosing the strategy? How big the table is. You would choose open addressing or you would choose separate chaining depending on the size of the table? I'm, I'm just curious, like, which one would you choose for a big table and which one for a small? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so, let me see. so small is a relative thing, right? So small is relative to the number of things that you're putting into the table. If you were expecting to put in a lot of things into a table, then you would expect the load factor to be pretty high. And what works better when load factor is high is separate chaining. So for high load factor, uh, chaining is better performance-wise, um, assuming nice hash functions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but of course, if you have a high load factor and you're using an, uh, a hashing scheme, what would you do? If you're using open addressing and you had a high, or even separate chaining, and you have a high load factor, what should you do? I do this call for reviews. Reviews often are easy. What would you do if your load factor is too high? Yes. Change the size of the table, resize. So resize can fix this. Uh, it'll decrease the load factor. By the way, alpha is the load factor. Yeah. Is this both open and resize? Yeah. Yeah. Because imagine. The definition of the load factor is the number of things you put into the table divided by the table size. So if I make the table size bigger in either situation, I'm decreasing the load factor. No. Open addressing and chaining for from high load factor scenario. So I guess for open addressing, if you want to add another item into a table that was already pretty full. They'll have to, I guess, like walk down, like walk down the table. So then, so then with chain, we also, once we take a slot, we have to walk down the link list already in the slot. So is the reason that chain is better is that on average, the distance that we have to walk along the link list is less than the distance that we have to traverse through the table for open address? Correct. Oh. And you can understand why that's true, because you understand that separate chaining is called separate chaining because the chains are all separate, whereas in open addressing, these sequences that you are creating can join together and start multiplying in length and making your, your uh, essentially making the, the chain that you're looking through, the sequence of things you're looking through longer and longer. So well, that's what's happening. So the chain, so the chain is just walking through like a smaller than this. Essentially. I mean, on average. 
but you know, yeah. Anything else that's different? What that would just determine what collision resolution strategy you wanted to use? How about a more hardware-like question? You know, hardware-level type preference. No. I just don't have the same people answering questions. Somebody new has to. Yeah, if you have simple hardware, like you have a router or something like that that doesn't really want to spend time doing memory management during its operation using a hash table, then you would like to allocate the space for the hash table and then don't worry about allocating space when you're inserting items into it. So you don't want to create nodes in a linked list when you're using something that doesn't want to call the memory manager during its execution. So for, for memory allocation, or maybe think of it as no, no memory allocation, for less memory allocation, uh, use, uh, use the open address. You have to get your memory in big chunks when you're using open addressing, like when you resize, you get another table that's twice as big as the other one, as the old one, but it's a one-shot deal for getting that memory, and then after that you use it until it's full. It's not like you're having to continually address. What other advantage does it have besides the fact that you might be running on a router which doesn't like to do memory management when it's executed? What other advantage does it have to allocate a hash table as a one contiguous array as opposed to doing it by sort of piece by piece, taking node by node into your link flow. Yeah. This is true for both, that you can access the index as long as your hash function is efficient. You can access the index, you can create the index in a constant amount of time. Um, there's something else that's in here. And in your, if there, is there anybody taking 2.13? Okay, come on. You're learning about memory management? No? Yes? Yes? Because like, it does be placed yeah, exactly. Yeah, in your in your computer, there's a memory hierarchy, and your memory hierarchy is slower as you go down the chain, but it operates on a paging system which pages memory in. We'll talk about this in just a second. And when it brings in a chunk of memory, it brings in consecutive locations. And if you've been allocating memory that isn't in consecutive locations, then that doesn't bring in very much information for you. But with a hash table, at least the idea is that it's been allocated in consecutive memory locations, and maybe with open addressing, when you paged in a chunk of it, you would be able to go through your probe sequence for several steps before you have to page in another chunk. So paging, memory allocation, so caching would be maybe better. Uh, caching also. Okay, what's the best dictionary? So we were talking about dictionary structures. We have uh, linked lists and arrays. We have um, ABL trees for binary search tree. We have hash tables. Which one is best? And it's one of those annoying questions where it depends on what you're asking for. So let me ask for worst case running time. What's the best dictionary for worst case runtime? Worst case runtime is smallest for. Ooh. It's not Friday, it's Wednesday. 
Yeah. Oh, you tell me what the options are. You don't know what a dictionary what dictionary data structures you've learned? That's not good. There's a midterm coming up in a week and a day. Yeah. Hash tables, they seem really good because hash tables have what they promise is sort of an indexing scheme to get constant access to a memory, lo to, to the, the dictionary entry given just the key. So you can use the key as an index into the hash table. And so the, the hope is that it works in constant time. But what's the worst case running time of a hash table that contains n key value pairs? What's the worst case running time? Yeah. Yeah, it's big omega of n. So the worst case running time is greater than or equal to some constant times n for hash tables. Now, this is worst case. However, if you choose your hash function at random from a set of universal hash functions, then the expected time for performing a find operation or an insert operation is constant. So it's expected big O of 1 for uh, uni for hash function chosen at random from why did they name this universal? Universal hash function family. Yay. What's your best worst case dictionary that you know right now? Is this the curse of multiple choice tests? Like you just blank if I don't give you a bunch of choices? Is it true? They don't typically give you multiple choices in interviews. <laughs> just ask you. What's the best data structure that you know of for doing dictionary operations? Fastest, worst case. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. So this is assuming, for example, that you're using open addressing or that you're using chaining with the linked list. But if you stick a data structure into one of your hash table nodes, then whatever the performance of that dictionary structure in that hash table node has, it's going to be your worst performance. If all n items happen to hash to that location, then you would have essentially the performance of that structure. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So you were thinking of a structure to into the hash table? What structure? A binary search tree? <laughs> what kind of binary search tree? An ABL tree. You've forgotten ABL trees? ABL trees are self-balancing trees. They're amazing. When you insert something into an ABL tree, it doesn't go deep. It balances itself. ABL trees have performance that's worst case log in. So if you stuff an you know, AVL tree into the hash table location, then you would get the performance of an AVL tree, which is log in. So your best worst case one is AVL trees right now. Has order log in for all of those operations. Insert, find, delete, or remove. Um, order log in. However, in practice, hash tables are really, 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 really fast. So... It's just that, that theoretically they're not in one of the first case. Yeah. Oh, going back to the hash table, I was wondering how many expected cases they go one. Because I thought, like, like when we say expected, it might be like average case, but 
So for an average case, if we try to find an element from a hash table, we might have to navigate the linked list in one of the slots. So would it be a bit longer than constant? This is like a, okay, this was a long sentence that I wrote there. And I didn't want to write any more. But the other stuff that you have to write in there is that you've chosen to size your hash table so that it's not like size three and you're, ha and you're hashing n things into it. So the size of the hash table has to be reasonable, but reasonable sized hash tables are just a constant factor larger than the number of things that you expect. So if you're using a reasonable resize policy, then you would get, if you chose a hash function that was chosen from a universal family of hash functions, then you would get this kind of performance, expected, expected performance. Written. Technically, the expectation of the number of comparisons that you perform is constant. So yeah, so there's extra stuff that I didn't write down. You're absolutely right, but I believe that you guys know all this stuff, right? Like if you're operating on a hash table whose load factor is larger than one, don't resize the table. Okay, uh, so I mean, ABL trees are great because they have best worst case performance that we know of, but we have hash functions now, and if we choose them according to the universal properties, then we've got great performance and expectation, and that's probably good enough. Why are we, why do I even teach binary search trees or ABL trees? Why? What advantage do those things have? What disadvantage? Well, disadvantage is they have log n worst case running time, which is smaller than order one, which is the expected running time of hash trees. But why would I why would I want to use binary search trees? A hash function. Yeah. Binary search trees are fast. Yeah, in worst case, sure. Login is not that big, it's okay. But there's really a reason to use binary search trees if you want to, for example, do a range query. Like you say, I don't really know what key I want. I want a key that's between apple and kiwi. Between apple and kiwi. I want all of the keys that are between apple and kiwi. Try to do that in your hash hash table. Good luck. Hash tables don't require orderable keys, so the keys don't have to be orderable. That's a good thing, but it's a bad thing if you want to do things like range queries. So okay, a range query is give me all of the dictionary entries between aardvark and Banshee, a range of values, a range of key values, all between A and B, where A and B are two keys. You want everything between those two. And there's also other things you might be interested in doing with a binary search tree. You might want to find, for example, the <laughs> smallest key or the largest key or the middle key, uh, and those things can be done um, because the values are comparable. Okay, if you're really curious about hash functions and universal hash functions and what you can say about them and what really can't be done, what can't be said, Jeff Erickson's online notes for hash functions are fun to read. I know that sounds weird, but they are fun to read. He like has comic strips, he has jokes, he has like, you know, huge big red signs that say, don't do this. It's great. They're fantastic. So I highly recommend taking a look at those notes if you're interested in it. Okay, we're done with hashing, unless you have any questions. Yep. Sorry, so a range query is like finding all the keys between A and B or like the value? The key value pairs between a pair of keys. I, instead of giving you one key, I give you two keys, and I say, give me everything in the dictionary between key A and key B. And it tells you, oh, I've got something called a uh, back, which lies, well, it's not between B, but anyway. 
it gives you every key value pair between those two. Yep. So it's the same area three that something else is. Yes. So like for in the worst case. In the worst case. However, like many things, it's not hard to avoid the worst. No, it's not true. Like very few things, it's not hard to avoid the worst case in this case. You can use randomness to avoid the worst case. That randomness is the selection of a hash function at random. And when we do that, we avoid that worst case or at least we have a low probability of going into that worst case. So actually, for example, the Python dictionaries are implemented with hash tables. Yeah. The Java dictionaries are implemented with hash tables. And the Java dictionary before 2011 was implemented with a fixed hash function. And then after they told them that it was implemented with a fixed hash function, they should fix it, they said, well, the initial reaction was, eh, who cares? Pretty much. But they came around. Um, any other questions about hash functions? Okie dokes. Uh, so I've been mentioning the memory hierarchy. I thought I'd show you the memory hierarchy, at least a picture of the memory hierarchy. This is the memory hierarchy. So at the top of the memory hierarchy, with very fast access, is the registers that live on the same chip as your CPU. Now there's lots of stuff that lives on the same chip as your CPU, but the registers are the ones that are really, 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 really fast and very close. They take very little time to access memory that's stored in those registers. Other stuff that's on the chip are the, this whole two top levels, the cache memory, the L1, L2, L3 cache memory that's in your computer, all of that stuff is typically on chip, it's on the chip that the, the processor is in. That means it's very fast, but of course there's not much space on your on this chip because there's so much stuff crammed on it and it heats up to like, I don't know, like huge temperatures nowadays. So there's not very much room, so the amount of memory that you have that's really close to the CPU, the amount of memory is like megabytes at most. And so, oh yeah, just to remind you, megabytes are 10 to the sixth, 10 to the sixth bytes. And so in order to get more memory, you have to go off chip and the first place you go off chip is to main memory, which is on your motherboard or in your computer. And it has to be accessed via the fetch, retrieve, memory bus thing. And so your CPU has to say, hey, give me some memory. And it says, okay, where do you want it from? And it tells the address and the end, the data comes back, and it takes forever. It takes hundreds of cycles, not forever, because each cycle is like a nanosecond, so it's not like... You're getting old, waiting. But still, it takes more than the cycles that your CPU are using to process stuff. So your CPU has to wait for the data. It does other stuff, don't worry. Then, after main memory, after you've exhausted main memory, you get down to a disk. And there's a solid state disk, and there's uh, hard drives, which actually have mechanical, mechanical features in them. Uh, but anyway, they can store lots of stuff, terabytes of data, in fact, more and more and more and more and more stuff. But it takes a long time, like millions of cycles, to say, hey, disk, give me some data. Because there's like a mechanical arm that has to like move over to where the data is, and there's a platter that's spinning around, and it has to split, spin the data underneath the mechanical arm. Do you guys, you still know record players, right? It's like a record player. It's sitting there in your deck, in your in your computer. It's a really fast record player, but it's still a record player. So you just like mm -hmm. so years later, millions of cycles later, millions of years ago, we weren't even around. Millions of cycles later, there's your data. Oh great, thanks. So that's the memory hierarchy. So when you look at this memory hierarchy, you think 
every disk access costs me so much money, so much time. Why should I care about time? Why should I just care about the number of disk accesses? And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about a data structure that cares more about disk accesses than it does about anything that the CPU does. Because the CPU can do a million instructions for one disk access. I mean, that's, you know, who cares how efficient the algorithm is? You're waiting for data. Okay. So, oh yeah, I drew a picture. Uh, I did this this morning. I should have remembered. This is, um, this is your, this is the turntable that's inside your computer, unless you have a solid state drive, which is just memory. Um, and it spins at 7200 RPMs, and it has this arm, and the arm moves from track to track. There's a purple track and an orange track. And so you, if you want data from some other track, the arm has to move. That's the gray thing. It moves. It's got a pivot point right there. That dot there is a pivot. And then the thing has to rotate so that the data that it wants gets underneath the arm. And then the arm, the little, the little red spot here at the end, that's the read right head for the disk. And it eventually gets over the physical location of the bits that are stored on that disk and reads them in. That's what takes so long. Okay. So there's just like more statistics on how slow everything is. Uh, you know, this disk seek time is 10 milliseconds, which is forever. And in terms of, of you know, your gigahertz CPU. So it's a long time to wait. Um, there are a couple of things to mention here. One is because of the way the disk works, once you're on a track that you want to be on, and the disk is spinning underneath the read head, it's very efficient, or relatively very efficient, to read a consecutive sequence of bits from that disk. So what happens when you're reading from a disk is that it, it just says, well, I'm pretty sure you're going to want some more data sometime soon. I will just read a chunk of data, call it cache block, and I will send the whole cache block to the CPU so it can stick it in some level one, level two, or level three cache. And that's fast. That's, that sequential access on a, on a hard drive, that sequential access is a lot faster than the random access. The seek time, which is the time for the arm to move and the, and the rotating platter to get underneath the head, that's a long time. But once it's there, then it's, you know, it's rotating at 7,200 revolutions per minute, so it's, it's pretty quick to get some data off of there. So that's what it does. It reads it off a little bit at a time, uh, which is why you don't, uh, why people have operational terabyte disk drives. Otherwise, it would take 300 years to read your terabyte disk drive. It doesn't work that way. So you read, this is the important part here. Each disk read, right, moves more than one byte, moves a chunk, and sequential disk access is faster than seek, so that's the way it works. Consecutive memory locations from a disk. Do you have questions about this? Did you learn about this anywhere? Is this the first time you've seen this? What do they teach you in 213? <laughs> Well, I'm glad you're taking this course because this is where, you know, this is like, you got to know this stuff. Anyway, you don't want to know. Don't these In the old days, you could actually take the disk. There was floppy disks, right? There were these things that were floppy. And you could actually take them, slice the envelope open, pull the disk out, flip it over, and put it back in again. And you could get the other side because they, you know, they put it on both sides. They have data on both sides. So, yeah, I had slid open a bunch of floppy disks to get more space. And you punch a new hole in the access side so you can flip the disk over. And anyway, it was great. Don't do that anymore. Looks too good. Okay. Uh, so the point is we want to minimize disk access. So let's. this is just to tell you what the sizes of the, of the, of the, of the chunks are that are being passed back and forth. Um, there's typically going from a disk that's a few kilobytes of data, so 1,000, 2,000, something like that, kilobytes, that goes into the main memory. The main memory is doing something like 
like maybe 100, maybe 250, something like that, bytes to go into uh, the cache. And then the cache uh, spits a few bytes up into the CPU for register storage whenever it's, um, it's asked for some data. So those are the sizes of transfer, the unit of sizes for transfer between the levels of the memory hierarchy. And they're called different things, a word, a cache line, or a page, depending on what level it is. But look, everybody will know what you're talking about when you say, I am paging in something from main memory. They'll know that you mean you're actually bringing in a cache line from main memory. So it doesn't... Um, right, so there, again, the point is that random access between levels, this is random access to non-consecutive locations. That's what I mean by random access. If your random access happened to be to sequential locations, then you're good. The whole chunk comes in at once. But if it's jumping around, like when you allocate linked list nodes and they happen to be allocated all over the place, then you get poor performance because one disk read will only bring in a few of those um, nodes. So if you think about binary search trees, let's think about binary search trees. The binary search trees are allocated, you allocate the nodes in a binary search tree uh, when you insert. So you follow path down to a leaf node, <coughs> you insert the new node down at the leaf level, maybe if it's an AVL tree you perform some rotations, but that new insertion creates a memory, creates memory locations for uh, the new node that has really nothing much to do with the memory location of its parent or the memory location of its grandparent. So the next time that you go down the leaf to insert, down to a leaf to insert something in the binary search tree, then probably what will happen is that you'll be bringing in new cache lines for each of the nodes that you're visiting, right? The child of the node that you're currently at, the one that you want to go to, will not be on the same cache line or the same page as you are. There's no locality there. Okay, so how do you fix that? So this is the idea of multi-way search tree, is that you basically put all of the nodes for an entire subtree in one cache block. So this block here is one page. And it's, those nodes are stored in consecutive locations within that block so that when you page something in, you get the entire block, get the whole thing. And if I could arrange things to be to work like this, if I could arrange it so that my nodes are allocated in this fashion, this would be a, very, a much more efficient way to traverse a tree. It would save me the potential... I'm not liking green anymore. Let's change to reddish. Change to uh, it would change to a new a new cache block only when you go from one block to the next. That's the only disk access price that you would pay in getting from the root down to the leaf. I mean, you'd have to do an access here to get the root. And then you'd have to do another access to get down to the to the next block. But all of these accesses in between would be free in, in the, in, from the point of view of the disk access. Does it make sense? So what's the problem with this? Is that we have a binary tree. And when I insert into a binary tree, I want to create a new leaf. And when I create a new leaf, the new leaf goes down here. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Yeah. Is this added to a page containing the subtree? Well, there's no more room in this page. I, I basically maxed out this page. It's full. 
And what do I do? Yeah. Yeah, so I could start a new page. I could just make another huge block, and I could say, I'm going to make this new page have space for lots of nodes in it. And they're not used yet, but they will be, or not. But it's kind of anticipating that that structure is going to want to use more memory and allocating it for the structure right when you create the first node. Yeah. Yeah, the KDL cubes are pretty much the depth is about log in within a factor of two. So depending on how big n is, the levels could be off by a bit for one side of the tree to the other side of the tree. But for a particular node, the heights would be within just one of the So but I'm not necessarily suggesting that this is going to be a great thing to do for ADL tree. So it's not so bad. You can imagine balancing based on blocks, right? You can imagine treating a block as sort of a node in maybe L tree and only being off by one in terms of your block height rather than your node height. And then you could, you could make that work. Yep. So what did you mean by like the different block sizes? Oh, you mean here? Oh, I mean, when you are talking about how much data the disk transfers into main memory when you perform a disk access, that's huge. It's like a few kilobytes. Yeah, when you ask for, when you ask for anything from the disk, it gives you a kilobyte. It gets stuck into main memory typically first, and then it goes up, the, but there's... This architecture is not my business, you know, because it changes too quickly. So you could imagine that there is some fast track that gets it up into the CPU. But typically the sizes decrease as you go up. So what happens is this chunk, this few kilobytes, gets into main memory. Then some subset of that gets into cache memory. And then some subset of that gets brought up into the CPU, the actual data that was needed. Now you've populated your hierarchy with this one kilobyte of data. So the next time you ask for something, it doesn't go off to disk anymore. If it's consecutive, it will go, it'll either hit in the cache or it'll hit in main memory. And both of those are astronomically faster than going out to disk. Because you already got those things to go away. Yeah, because they're already sitting there in the main memory. Okay, so this is really kind of like a clunky thing to do because, I mean, well, it's, it'll work, but it's kind of a weird thing to do, right? So, but this is the basis of the idea behind MRE search trees. So you know about binary search trees. MRE search trees are just binary search trees except that instead of having two children, you have M children. So these are the M children. Oops. M children uh, uh, search trees. And you can imagine how they work. Every node has, well, it's like a binary tree. Every node has at most M children. Like a binary tree, you can have a node that has just one child. This is every tree has, every, every node has at most M children. And now, if you wanted to perform search in an MRE search tree, you have to decide what child you should search in if I give you a key to find. So I give you a key. Now you say, where do I go? I've got M children, potentially, to choose from. How do I pick where I go? And that's exactly like what we were doing here. You know, you come in with you know, some key, it would work its way down here, and it would come out one of these uh, channels coming out of the block based on the comparisons that are performed above. But 
instead of doing all those that in that kind of a binary tree fashion, what you could imagine is just having an array which tells you what the split points are for the children. So everything that's smaller than three goes into the leftmost child. Everything that's, so there's a key, this is a splitting key, three. Everything that's between three and seven goes into the second child, etc. So successive items in this, uh, in, the, in the, the set of keys in the node, tell you uh, which uh, child to go into. So you can think of it, if you'd like to, you could do binary search because they're ordered, right? This is an ordered sequence of keys. So you could do binary search if you'd like. Or you could just do linear search because we're really for what we're going to be talking about, we're really not worrying about CPU cost. We're worrying about disk accesses. Anyway, whatever you want to do, you take your your key and you compare it against three and seven and twelve and twenty-one until you find where you belong. If you happen to be the key number fifteen, you belong between twelve and twenty-one, which means you belong in here. So fifteen would be if you're inserting it. We insert into that subtree. And that subtree itself is the node, the root node of this subtree is exactly the same sort of thing. There's a bunch of possible keys, split keys, at the root, and you do the same thing. It's just like a binary search tree. Just in a binary search tree, you have one key, two children. In an M area search tree, you have M children, and how many keys? M minus one. Did I write that down? Oh yeah, I did. Each node has less than or equal to M minus one switch keys. And if you want uh, to find which which subtree you're going to, you perform some sort of search on the set of keys. And if your key A uh, is between the I and the I plus first, then you go into uh, the appropriate subtree there. Yeah, it's I subtree. Any question about this? No. Oh, sorry, I'm still not too sure what you mean by M minus one search key. So, like, for example, from three to seven, there's like four possible keys that can uh, actually take like, uh, four, uh, like three different keys that can go into the key. And then between seven and twelve, there's like four keys that can go into the no, that's not so. The number of keys between two keys is not what I'm. What I'm think think of the keys as being uh, real numbers, and I just happen to be lazy and only write down integers. So there's an infinite number of numbers between seven and twelve. What I'm saying is that any key that comes in that is between seven and twelve will be directed to go to the third tree in the in the group. Anything that comes in that's smaller than three will be directed to go into the first tree. Just like in a binary search tree where we have a node with a value in it. Oops, I didn't read. It's a node with a key value in it to direct traffic at that node. When you come in and the thing that you're looking for is smaller than x, it goes this way. If it's bigger than x, it goes that way. It's exactly the same thing. It's just that we have multiple keys now. And so we have ranges. And those ranges are three to well zero in, minus infinity to three, three to seven, seven to twenty, twelve, twelve to twenty-one. Now the okay, this is a great question. What is the value of m for this for a tree that has that kind of node? What is m for that? I have to see if I can calculate myself. This is a node in an M area tree for what value of M? Should we vote? How many people think it should be six? You guys are quiet, but you're hard to fool. Seven. Maybe you're just quiet. <laughs> Eight. 
Okay, everybody has to vote. Six, seven, or eight. Ready? Six. The num this is the M value for the MRE tree. MRE tree. Six. Seven. Eight. Okay, M is the number of children. If I have, for example, a binary tree, there are two children. An M binary tree has M children. How many keys do I hold in a node if I'm a binary tree? I hold one. That determines it. It's M minus one. So the number of keys here is M minus one keys to allow me to go into M different trees. And so if this is M minus one, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six is equal to M minus one, which means M is equal to seven. So M is seven in this case. Yes. Oh, I didn't know it was related to that specific thing. I thought it was like in general. So I got confused. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a reasonable explanation. Yeah. M is the number of children per node. So in a binary tree, the number of children per node is at most two. So M is two for a binary tree. For an M binary tree, you can pick M to be whatever you'd like. And I was saying for this particular example, what is M? If I tell you that the node contains six different keys to distinguish among its children, how many children does it have? And the answer is, well, if I told you that there was only one key in the node to distinguish among the children, how many children does it have? Two. Two. So if it had two keys, how many children could it distinguish among? Three. I could have people that are smaller than the first child, people that are between the first and the second, and people that are bigger than the last second. So there's three piles of keys that are split by, think of this as being sort of like a gate, right? And you're saying, I'm putting up um, uh, barriers. Here's a barrier, here's a barrier. And I'm saying, okay, everybody go. And there's only three ways to enter. You can go on this side of the barrier, you can go between the two barriers, you can go on that side of the barrier. And that's essentially what this direction, this node is doing. It's directing traffic. Yeah? So like the um, value of n is determined by the size of the way like how Well, you know, the size, m is determined by you, and then you size the node accordingly. If you want a binary tree, choose m to be 2, and the number of keys in the node is going to be 1. If you would like to make a ternary tree, m would be 3, and you would choose two things in the node. So like even if the subtree is like even if there's only one key applied, it's still the only thing so I'll That's exactly right. Yeah. So for those values, three seven four like you just does that mean that they each have their own value? Uh say it again in a different way. Like so you know how like a top of the three seven four one. Yeah. And they all point to their own. Well, in between them, they po point to different trees. In between them, that's where the that's why I cleverly used my little lines starting in between, which I've now ruined. Anyway, but you can sort of see they're connected in between. It means all the things that are in between seven and twelve go into the in between seven and twelve tree. tree. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're wondering about the data associated with the key? Yeah, so actually I'm not drawing the data because, again, I'm lazy and I didn't want to do that. But you can imagine that the third most popular cat name in Japan is... Not May, but something like that. Anyway, you could attach the, the data here if you want. It's stored there in this node with 12. 
or three or whatever the one was. Okay. Okay. Next, yes. Maybe I don't have enough keys to fill up the tree. So you should have like Exactly like we talked about in the previous case, we pre-allocated a structure that may not be quite full. Okay, next time we'll actually talk about bee trees, really. So this has all been great for talking about bee trees. <laughs>